Good morning. Very nice to see you all again. Now we are going to do something extremely fun. My mom always said, life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. I'm having what the Germans call a schadengasm. shot of his whiskey. Sell crazy someplace else. We're all stocked up here. I, I believe it or not, I watch my words very carefully. There are those that think I'm a very stable genius, okay? Hey everybody, what's up? Hello. Good to see you all here for this week's live stream where I'm going to talk about the human mouth. It's anatomy, how to draw it, how to paint it. Um, it's a misunderstood feature, I think. Um, one thing that bugs me when I hear people say it is the eyes are so expressive and people just totally forget the mouth. Uh, strictly speaking, the mouth is way more expressive than the eyes on the human face in the conveyance of emotions. I mean, people look more at the eyes, I think, but uh, the mouth is doing all the work. Uh, it's the most movable feature because it has the most muscles controlling it. The eyes have like four or five, maybe six muscles overall just controlling the, the expressions that happen up here, whereas the mouth has like 11 or 12. And, uh, and it's, there's like no bone. It's just all movable muscle tissue and fat. So the mouth does a lot of work, and because of that, because it moves so much, the anatomy isn't as consistent. So I had to just basically choose today and just say, hey, the anatomy of the mouth we're going to look at today is the mouth in the neutral closed position, because all bets are off when it starts moving around, uh, because the forms and the planes just completely change and distort, you know, from this to this, so... Um, but if you understand the basics, most artwork that we draw when we're doing portrait work, figure work, fine art type stuff, uh, is going to be the mouth in the neutral closed position. It's really only in illustration art and, and caricature, caricature illustration, where people will be doing different expressions or smiling. So um, just keep that in mind, though, when I'm going over the anatomy, that it's uh, the, the forms and the planes, anyway, they change. And uh, the, some of the things that I say are like, you know, this is, what, this is what the mouth looks like is not going to be consistent when it moves. Let's say hello to folks who are here. We got Sargon from Uzbekistan. Hey. And hey, Dorian, good to see you. And Alan, Shiny, Raktino, 
Uh, Great Touch is back. Hey. Hello, Anton. Uh, Patrick, hey, good to see you here. Uh, Debbie will be joining us in just a few minutes um, to help us out with all your questions on your chat on the chat. So, like always, just type in your questions as they come up, and I'll try to answer them. Debbie will try to bring them to my attention because I focus more on this as I'm working, and I don't always see the questions and comments. So, all right, let's take a look at the anatomy. Um, I've got a few photos here and some diagrams I lifted from books. I've never seen one single diagram in any art book, though, that uh, totally encapsulates or covers everything you see in uh, on mouth anatomy in particular. Uh, and sometimes people use different terms for things, which I'll go over in just a minute. Um, but instead of starting with like anatomy and anatomical terms, I'm going to start first with the forms and the planes and just talk about that, because that's really what's most important is understanding those the consistencies on people's mouths. And when I say consistencies, I mean stereotypes, because everyone, there's everyone who's, I'm sorry, uh, there's always going to be someone who breaks that, and it's, you know, that aren't, it doesn't fit the norm or the average, of course. Um, you know, some people might have more rounded forms, but people might have more angular forms, but I'm going to, to speak for generals, like the idealized version of the mouth that we see uh, often in art or in sculpture, the, the planes that we uh, typically see on the mouth. But I've assembled a couple different diagrams here and even added a couple of my own terms because, like I said, the uh, uh, diagrams I usually find in books are a little lacking. They don't have everything that they should have. All right, let's um, move this over so you can see as much as possible. Um, uh, I'll, we'll just actually, yeah, like I said, just go and talk about the planes first and then I'll go over the anatomical terms. So I'm going to do a quickie drawing here of uh, the human mouth. And whenever I draw the mouth, I generally start by drawing the line itself, uh, the, the, the average line of the mouth opening. And that's the foundation of everything. I get the width and its placement. Um, the first thing to keep in mind, though, of course, is that the mouth is on a uh, cylinder. It wraps around the uh, forms of the um, maxilla on top, the dental arch of the maxilla, and the dental, lower dental arch of the mandible on the bottom. So looking at it at an angle... Looking at it, like say from below, the mouth line is going to be something like this. It's going to follow the curvature of the mouth. I'm sorry, the curvature of the uh, skull. And then on top of that, the forms of the mouth are sort of concave in general. They come out from the front plane of the mouth. So if I've got the uh, the cylinder of the the cylinder that I just drew here, just from the total side view here, and here's the mouth plane on the left side. Uh, just keep in mind, though, that if there's a center line of the face, the mouth does something more like this, where it's it comes out, protrudes in front. So when I draw my guidelines, the guidelines of the mouth are going to follow this frontal curvature and not the straight up and down center line of the head. So that leads me to, like, the, the Riley rhythms that I usually like to draw when I am drawing the mouth, because it helps me construct the mouth three-dimensionally in perspective. And that's this triangle shape that starts, if you're looking at me here, um, from the septum of the nose, there's these ridges, the septal ridges um, on the other side of the philtrum. The philtrum is that divot in the middle uh, on your upper lip. And it traces the, to the crest of the upper lip on either side and then the corners of the lower lip where the lips go from a horizontal line to a diagonal line. And then to the outside uh, of the chin, the chin boss area down to the curvature of the jaw and the chin where they meet. So that's all verbal here. Let me show you what that looks like. It's essentially just this triangle here that, again, projects off the front plane of the face, so it looks a little uneven in this view. But, but I usually draw this angle first, these angles first, this triangle shape. If the nose, say the bottom of the nose plane is here, and this is the mouth line here. And so what these lines do is they mark out for me the peaks of the upper lip and the corners of the lower lip, and then, of course, the uh, front of the chin. So I will just sort of eyeball it right here like this and then the lower border of the mouth area is what we call the mentolabial sulcus or the mentolabial crease or fold it's just basically where the lower plane of the lip meets the top plane of the chin right here i'll go over a little bit more about the anatomy in just a minute 
but that's essentially the linear forms, the structure of the mouth and the lips. And let's see. There we go. And um, beyond that, I want to talk about the actual three-dimensional volumes or the forms. If we're looking again at the mouth, let's do just a front view here. I'm just going to draw a, a straight line side to side. The corners or the angles of the mouth here. And I guess the center line's right about there, just sort of eyeballing it. Um, the upper lip tends to be uh, composed of... There's two ways to look at it in this, you know, I don't know, maybe it's a little complicated, not super complicated, but there are sort of three lobes or rounded forms to the upper lip and two lobes to the bottom lip or spherical forms. So there's this form here in the middle that dips down at the mouth line. It's called the tubercle of the upper lip. Uh, another new word for it is the uh, prokylon, but that's just like, you know, I, I don't know, it doesn't sound very, it doesn't really exactly roll off the tongue. Tubercle is usually the term I've heard. And the tubercle is just a general term for any kind of round outgrowth or a protuberance on a form, like a wart. A wart is a type of tubercle. So it's just this fleshy prominence on the uh, upper lip here. Uh, so basically there's these three uh, forms or rounded spherical, well, elongated spheres. And then there's two for the lower lip, one on either side of the center line here. So that's one way to look at the lip, is, is the forms, the rounded forms. The other way is to think about it in terms of planes, and there's a different number of flat planes. Draw that again at the center line here. Uh, so the, there tends to be, I guess it's four planes uh, to the upper lip and three planes to the bottom. So if you draw a face or a draw a mouth that's a little more angular, you, you might see the planes more than you'll see the rounded forms. So the planes are thus. We got the two planes for the tubercle of the upper lip and then one plane each for the wings of the upper lip. And they're usually called wings because they sort of shape like bird's wings. Uh, and then the lower lip has three planes, a, a front facing upward facing plane and two upward facing side planes. So we got one, two, three, four on the upper lip, and one, two, three on the bottom. And you'll often see if the light is coming from the side, you'll see you know one side of the tubercle is uh, in shadow and one is not. And the same thing with the uh, one of the wings of the upper lip. And then the, uh, the lower lip plane over here on the right side will be uh, in shadow. And then you know it might be actually sort of rounded off and it'll transition to the light form. But essentially it's three planes on the on the bottom lip. And then, of course, the uh, area just under the lip will be in shadow. So that's the basic understanding of the lip area. Of course, we've got the areas around it. And I guess now's a good time to sort of get into the anatomy. Uh, well, I'll keep those visible, I guess. So as you can see here from my diagrams, um, there's a few different terms for things. The area just below the mouth on either side, just below the red portion of the lips, is generally called the pillars of the mouth. So these forms here, uh, they're usually a downward, outward-facing plane, and I guess they sort of look like they're supporting the mouth, so they're called the pillars. The, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the mentolabial sulcus, or the mentolabial crease, is this uh, division between where the area of what we call the mouth ends and the chin begins. In this form of the chin, this upward-facing plane is generally called the chin boss in the anatomy, in, uh, in the books just because it's the big prominent form below the uh, mouth, I guess it's just called the chin boss. And there is a muscle right underneath there that corresponds to that called the mentalis, but we're not gonna get into the muscles today. I do have a picture of the uh, muscles, uh, just in case it did come up. Uh, and the mentalis is just uh, right here in the lower portion, right in the middle beneath the uh, mouth. And that's responsible for pushing your lower lip upward when you're pouting or angry. Uh, then, the actual red lip portion in a lot of the books and the things I found is generally called the vermilion. 
or the red, the red portion of the lips, the, the vermilion part, portion of the lips, just because the capillaries of blood is are much closer to the surface where your red lips are, and that just gives it its coloration. And some people, though, the uh, the red lip portion of their lips is not that dark. In fact, you'll see in these, uh, I have color uh, photos here and black and white photos. In the color photos, it's kind of deceptive. It looks like the lips are a much darker value than the surrounding skin. Uh, but it's generally not the case. If you look at the grayscale version of these lips, uh, they're almost the exact same value as the skin around it. So a lot of people make the mistake of making lips too dark in value, and it makes it look like the person's wearing lipstick. Uh, some people do have darker lips in, average, in general, like uh, the subject here, which is actually a famous person on the far right. Uh, his lip uh, shades are a little darker than his skin. Uh, but the person next to him here, who's another uh, celebrity, uh, his lips are almost pretty much the exact same value as his skin. If anyone can guess who these two are, let us know in the chat. Uh, because you can often tell a person's likeness just from one single feature, which underscores the importance of being able to draw those features individually accurately. Because if you screw up just the mouth and doesn't you don't capture the likeness of someone's mouth, you could mess up the likeness of the rest of the face. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, yeah, no new no guesses yet or new questions. Looks like you guys are all just intently listening, which is great. Um, of course, if any questions pop up, let me know. Um, I'm still going over the anatomy, so you may have questions after that. Uh, let's make this a little bit bigger, though, the, uh, the anatomical studies here, the anatomical drawings. Um, the corners of the mouth are generally called the angle of the mouth, the corners, just where the, the mouth line ends on either side. And then, likewise, the cr there's often a crease when you get a little older, a little wrinkle that forms on uh, below the corners of the mouth. It's called the... Um, what is it called? The, I guess this book calls it the, uh, uh, I don't know, the angular crease of the mouth. I don't know. The corner of the mouth wrinkles. <laughs> um, it, it, people call it different things. There's no one single term for all of these things. It's just whatever whatever works as long as you understand what you're talking about. Um, there is a, an, uh, a term, though, for the uh, creases around the outer portion of the mouth, and that's the laugh lines. It's what they're known as colloquially. Colloquially. <laughs> Uh, or the uh, ment mentolabial, I'm sorry, the nasal labial furrows. It gets pretty complicated when you're talking about all this stuff. Uh, but then, yeah, the nasal labial furrows because it connects the nasal area down to the labial area. But the important thing to remember about the laugh lines or the nasal labial furrows is they do not generally touch the corners or the angles of the mouth. There's always this separation right here. And that's because there is a collection of muscle and skin right there called the node or the modiolus. And what it is, is if you look at the uh, anatomy of the mouth here, there's this area just on the outside corner of the mouth where all these tissues, all these muscle fibers overlap and intersect. And they form almost a kind of a bump uh, right there that's called the node. And it has a lot of, you know, strength and presence. And there's, it's just the attachment point of a lot of muscles. It's the anchor point. So that will prevent a wrinkle from actually forming there. There's usually, like I said, that space between the corner of the mouth and the uh, nasal labial fold. And you'll see it more in this diagram here. Uh, the area of the node is sort of circled right here. And it actually lies underneath the uh, nasal labial fold in most people uh, because the nasal labial fold represents basically an attachment point where muscles are inserting into the surface of the skin. Uh, and that's why it actually creates a crease there is because that's where the muscles are grabbing onto the surface of the skin. Hello. Hey, Debbie's here. Helping to make it more interesting from all this uh, anatomy talk. Boring. No, uh, actually, yeah. it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, and that is mostly it for the names of the forms. Um, there's a groove sometimes on people's lower lips uh, called the groove of the lower lip, believe it or not. Uh, but some people, you don't see it at all. Sometimes it's just smooth on the lower lip. Um, also, just generally, uh, to keep in mind stereotypes about the lips and the mouth, generally the upper lip is going to be a little thinner than the lower lip. The lower lip will, on most people will be a little more fuller in volume, a little taller. Uh, again, there'll be exceptions to that rule, but that's what you want to see and look for when you're drawing, I think. And uh, also, in general, the lower lip tends to be more rounded in its forms. Uh, and smoothed out and the upper lip tends to be more planar or you know have has to be more angular made up of uh, planes but of course you can have rounded upper lips as well 
I'm just talking about the generalities when you're uh, drawing uh, people's faces. But you can see it in some of these uh, examples here too, especially when they're really well lit, like uh, uh, like uh, this one here. Uh, you can see the clear division at the tubercle. There's a uh, dividing line down the middle. Um, and I have another one here, another just page of, uh, of different lips in different lighting. Uh, and then there's like, like this one here actually is a pretty good example of uh, showing the uh, three planes of the lower lip because there's like a dividing line here where the highlight sort of stops and you can see the front plane of the lip and the side plane and then the other side plane wraps around the corner there. And incidentally, a little bit of trivia, there are no uh, sweat glands in the lips or hair follicles. So the lips never get really their own moisture. That's why your lips tend to get chapped or dry a lot. Because so, your lips don't sweat, but the upper lip does, and the lower lip below it does. You're talking about the areas that women would apply lipstick to do not have sweat or hair follicles. Correct. Yeah, they're the red portion or the vermilion portions of the lips. That's what they're On a good day. To. All right, so if there's any questions about that anatomy, if I skipped over anything or I contradicted myself, let me know. Uh, Alan, far right picture is Obama. You are correct. Yep, uh, Dorian and Arjun, you also, yep, a lot of people got that one right. And yeah, shiny, Michael Keaton was the other one. Good, uh, good eye on that one. Ding, ding, ding. Anton, yeah, also got it right. Yeah, so distinctive mouths on these guys. So th the rest are just, you know, friends or people I knew at the Watts Atelier, so... Uh, you won't recognize them probably but i'm going to use these as my examples uh for when i'm actually painting here so let's resize this uh, and i guess i'll keep the um the grayscale versions open as well uh i like this mouth on the left a lot because uh it's an older uh you know middle-aged man and he has more forms more uh, creases more uh nodes visible on the lips so that's a good one to actually study to understand the structure well we spent almost uh, 20 minutes on the uh, anatomy portion but it can be it can be kind of uh, daunting so daunting know. is an understatement <laughs> there will not be a quiz later correct no okay good because i wasn't paying attention uh, so the first thing i like to do generally is just get the uh, mouth line to, just to set the width of the mouth and the angle that it's going to be at. Then uh, I guess I can go ahead and find like the center line or the what might be actually more useful is the, the front triangle plane uh, from the ridges of the philtrum uh, down to the corners of the mouth down to the sides of the chin. And then the, the corner of the mouth, so because it's, it's on a cylinder, it wraps around on that left side and almost goes right back into itself. So it doesn't really extend much past uh, the ridges of the philtrum here. And so I'm doing the wing of the upper lip here. Generally, if you start out from the center line, the lips go up to a peak. Then for you know for, for short distance, and then they follow a downward trend for a, quite a long distance, and then often go back up at the corners of the mouth for a really short distance. And then you got the angle of the mouth right there, and then the modiolus underneath the skin, and then the laugh line. And the upper lip here is pretty thin. Like I mentioned, it's the the lower lip is pretty thin too, but it's a little bit thicker in this view than the upper lip. And there's a top facing plane and a sort of a front facing plane on the uh, on the lip here on the lower lip. And it's going to be straight horizontal until I get to the point past this uh, uh, this rhythm line I drew for myself, and then it curves back up. The lower lip tends to blend uh, with the pillars of the mouth. Uh, the more lateral you get, like the closer to the corner of the mouth here, uh, there's not as much of a ridge for that lip. All 
right. And then I'm going to draw the front plane of the, or the, where the pillars of the mouth meet the middle lower section of the mouth right over here. And then there's a nice sunken in area, a little furrow here on the outside corner of the mouth. Let me make that a little bigger now. I drew it a little small for our purposes here. Okay. Now let's go ahead and paint this in real quick. Because this is basically a painting class, a painting uh, workshop, not a uh, drawing. And I'll start with a middle gray just to cover up the white of the canvas. I'll make it sort of a warm gray. Okay, let's find um let's go ahead and find the darkest dark because I don't want to lose my drawing. I'm gonna reaffirm the the darks. Now let's go ahead and, I'll go ahead and paint on top of the line art actually. Don't want to uh don't need to really preserve it. All right, let's find the average value and color for the upper lip. Uh, and because it's lit from above uh, in this picture, the uh, upper lip is going to be more in shadow or a darker half tone. I would say, yeah, it's maybe in a shadow area. Pretty dark. And then the lower lip will be on mostly a, uh, it'll be a bit lighter because it's an upward facing plane. Although the front ridge of the lip is a little bit darker. And I'm just doing average values right now. I'm not doing, you know, highlights or anything like that. It's uh, just a bit of a process here. And the, the flesh tone, again, is about the same value roughly as, uh, I'd say, the value of the upper lip when it's in the light. So I can just sample that color and just, just move it over to a more fleshy, orangey tone. Okay, really rough, but that's just the initial block in here. So I want to find some intermediate tones uh, as the uh, mouth pillars of the mouth move over into the light. Going to lighten up a bit. And generally, it's actually going to be a little bit cooler on a person like this because he has that 5 o'clock shadow, the bit of a stubble, uh, and that's going to create a cooler value on the upper and lower lip areas, or upper lip and then the chin area beneath it. I think the uh, separation of this, uh, the tubercle is a little bit wide here. Let me narrow this up a bit. Get the distance between these two peaks here. I mean, I'm not necessarily trying to do a portrait of the guy, but I want to be sort of accurate. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Alan has a question. What's that? 
Due to the angle inclination of the plane of each of the lips, would that mean you would have to vary the amount of reflected light if the light comes from above? Yeah, there's, I mean, it depends on each person's lip anatomy. It's a little bit different for everybody. But yeah, the generalities are that it's, you know, there's um, this downward facing plane of the lip, but each of these planes is going to have a separate, uh, just maybe a slightly different value change. It's not really visible in this photo uh, that I'm using. Let me make it just a little bit bigger. Um, and maybe you can see better from the grayscale version right beneath it. Uh, but I'm going to put a little bit of a lighter value on like the side plane of the tubercle of the upper lip here, but not enough to be a full step difference, you know, in value change. It's just going to be right in that same value, just a little bit different. And uh, as the lips curve into the mouth line, it's definitely going to get darker and more saturated in coloration. Just because, well, it's going to be saturated right before it gets into the darkest part, but uh, just keep that in mind, you know, as the, sh as the shape moves away from the light, the coloration gets a little more saturated as it moves away from the light until you get to the actual shadow, in which case there's not much uh, color in there at all. Oh, another like sub, or what did you call it? Secondary or tertiary form of the lips that you'll see on a lot of people is a slight ridge at where the upper lip, the red portion of the lips meet the fleshy colors of, of the uh, mouth area. Uh, so just in this area right here, like that I'm sort of highlighting with my cursor right now, this area um, might have a little bit of a ridge and catch a little bit more of a highlight. And the same with um, the bottom uh, plane of the lip. It's uh, not, again, not really viewable here. It's not on this guy's lip, doesn't really tend to do that. Uh, there's a little bit of a ridge, a little bit of a highlight uh, on the lateral sides here, where it's just a slightly lighter value where the planes change. Uh, it's catching a bit of a light. But um, just keep in mind when you see that, you're not, it's not your imagination. There is a slightly lighter value just above the red portions of the lips, especially on the upper lip, because that's usually where the highlights are hitting, where the light's coming from above in most situations. even a bit of green in his skin here it looks like too so and it's just because i think he was uh, lit by fluorescent lights in uh, when i took this picture uh so you're gonna see some interesting light things happening you don't need to necessarily put these subtle color changes in here but that's just the way i paint i like to put a little bit of a I like to mix up the color a little bit create some more interest And I might um, play up the uh, spherical shapes of the lip a little bit more uh, to show the, the, that those lobes I was showing, like how the lower lip has two separate lobes on either side of the center line. Uh, it's, again, it's not super visible in here, but uh, I think it might be wise to show it anyway for purposes of demonstration. And there are often these um, lines or wrinkles in the upper lips, uh, the creases that form, uh, you know, up and down that goes straight up and down from the uh, mouth line. But those are like some of the last things I do. I generally don't put those in until the end because it's way more important to get the overall forms and uh, volumes correct. And those little details will just you might you might have to erase them if the vol the volumes don't look correct. So there's no point in spending time on them. They're just sort of set dressing. They're just uh, you know not critical to the overall look especially the further away you get you know on a real on a portrait or an illustration you're not going to be doing things like the little creases those little wrinkles in the lips it's only when you're doing an anatomical study like this
Okay, I'm just trying to blend this a little bit more evenly and smoothly in a, with a slightly different brush here. Those are some nice looking lips. Oh yeah. There may be a little, I mean, red. If I was doing this in an actual portrait, I'd probably subdue the colors a little bit. Um, and they are pretty saturated in red in this photo, but I think I might have boosted that a little bit just to make the forms a little more clear. If you were looking at this person in real life, I don't think he, his lips would look quite this luscious and red. <laughs> yeah, the values, again, are just way more important than the colors anyway. So if the colors aren't exact, that's fine. It's just it has to have a convincing value, uh, set of values that construct it. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, too, is when you're outlining, when you're drawing these lips on the face in context, uh, it's easy to d use lines that are too crisp and hard. Um, initially, my block in has crisp, hard lines, but as I progress, I might find places to, like, lose an edge or soften the edge just so it doesn't look like, you know, someone like him, a, a gentleman, isn't going to be wearing lipstick usually, so you don't want to have such a strong dividing line. Find places... Always try to find places to soften an edge wherever you can with things like the lips. Uh, it's more, more important with the lips than other features, I think, because they can tend to look pasted on or painted on like lipstick uh, if you make them too, uh, if you make the dividing line between the red and the, the flesh color uh, too obvious or too hard. It's like when a woman uses lip liner, usually now they try to blend that lip line in so it doesn't look so fake. And drawn on so kind of the same concept yeah this is why debbie's here <laughs> another perspective so i do have a question praveen is here i think he got in a little late but mm -hmm. uh he was wondering about teeth do you think uh maybe i know you're doing mostly closed mouths today because we talked about how that's usually what you do in a portrait but do you think maybe teeth would be worthy of a a live stream on their own Maybe. Um, the one thing to remember to keep in mind, if it concerns you at all, knowing where the teeth are behind the mouth, if you were to say take an x-ray of this, um, I'm going to pencil here, the, um, the separation between the upper teeth and the lower teeth usually is behind the upper lip. It's like right around there. And it's different for everybody. Again, somebody else may be different, but um, you can, you know, I don't know if you can feel it in your own mouth, you know, try to figure out where your lips and the teeth sit, but that's sort of where the division between the teeth are and then um oh i always do like to tell people too about when i'm talking about the node on the corners of the mouth how it's sort of its own little structure uh, i often tell people to stick their thumb and forefinger in the inside corner of their mouth if they're clean and you can actually feel a bit of a bump in this area right here and it's just the overlap all those overlapping muscles coming together in the same area all right here Oh, you want us to put it inside like, our yeah, mouth? Yeah, put one finger inside your mouth at the inside corner. Please clean your hands right, first. Right, right, right that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing that. And you can feel a bit of a bump on either, either corner of the mouth, and that's the node. Um, again, it's not a, a distinct structure. It's just a collection of different muscles all intersecting and overlapping, creating this bulkiness right there that helps prevent the, uh, the laugh lines from actually touching the corner of the mouth. Hmm. Interesting. Yep. Oh, you know, some other names I've heard for muscles too, like not muscles, the uh, wrinkles. Uh, the some people call the um, the wrinkles at the outside corner of the mouth the marionette lines, especially if they connect all the way down to the chin. Um, which, as you get older, it may start to happen. Uh, because it's not, it, it's kind of a weird name. It, like marionette doesn't actually make sense because marionettes usually don't have mu movable mouths. It's the ventriloquist dummies that have the movable mouth. But they've, they're called marionette lines for whatever reason. I think it's just a misnomer, but it's, uh, it's caught on a bit. 
you could always work to change that conception. Yeah, I don't really have misconception. A, I still have I a better name for it. <laughs> Just uh, you know the the wrinkles at the angle of the mouth. Those lines that make everybody look really old. And now I'm using a slightly harder brush, which helps show the uh, plane changes a little better, I think. Uh, and now, I mean, I'm getting close to the point at which, you know, the study is sort of done enough. I mean, it's not highly, highly rendered, but it, uh, I think it describes the forms fairly well in a three-dimensional way. But this is the point at which I might throw the uh, final highlights on the lips. And I'll use this opportunity, too, to use this streaky brush to create some of those ridges. And then like separate the uh, strokes so that the uh, ridges or the uh, wrinkles sort of appear in between the brush strokes for the highlights. And if you want to get a slightly darker value and maybe a, a darker brush, a smaller brush, you can draw some of those darker creases into the lips. Again, I wouldn't do this on a full on a regular portrait drawing or painting. That's just it's too much detail and it's distracting and just not necessary at all. <laughs> Uh, but if you want to be a really detailed painter, or if you're doing a mouth anatomical study, that might be where you want to do that. Or you might want to engage in some of that uh, detail work. There might be one area on the lips that's a little brighter of a highlight. Uh, I don't really see that on him. His lips aren't very wet, but if they were wet, they would have a really shiny highlight. Like, you probably, you know, here. About there. But that, that immediately changes his lips into more of a moist looking lip. And they're not really, but um, it's just where I would put that. Yeah, remember how the, um, don't forget how the uh, mouth dips in at the corners of the mouth and in people and a lot of people it's really really recessed there's a nice dark uh, value there because it's so deep and creased so if you take photos of your own subjects uh to draw just make sure that there's a good strong light source coming from one direction uh often from the above and from the side and that will help show the uh the uh, directions of the features pretty well Okay, let's do one more study. Uh, let's do a different mouth type here. Uh, I guess I should do a female mouth because I did the male mouth. Uh, and there's female mouth right here. And you know what? I think I'll do the one from the extreme angle because this angle here is almost exactly identical to the one I just did. So let's do one facing the other way and from pretty much almost a profile view here. Okay, uh, so the mouth is actually open here, and you know what? There's some teeth visible, so we will get a little bit into that. Like, uh, was it Praveen who was asking that? Mm -hmm. uh, so the mouth is sitting, you can really see the cylinder, the curvature of the uh, mouth here. And it's at an angle, it's sort of dipping down to the right. And if I want to imagine the cylinder of the mouth, it's sort of like this here we're looking slightly from below so we would see the bottom plane of the cylinder but i'm not going to draw the cylinder actually just want to show you what my thought process is so i found the corner of the mouth the angle of the mouth and just so you know from the front view and now looking back to me here uh the corners of the mouth the angles of the mouth generally line up with the irises or i'm sorry the the uh yeah the, where the irises meet the sclera or where the irises meet the pupil somewhere in that area right here you could draw a line straight down on most people in the neutral position when the mouth is closed uh the corners of the mouth will be right underneath uh the iris uh at the inside section you know the medial section of the iris and uh, from the front i'm sorry from the side view if you're looking at a profile the corner of the mouth will line up generally with the front plane of the eyeball if you draw a line straight down of course that rarely happens in reality as far as drawing a straight line down because a person has to have their head perfectly straight up and down for that to matter. But in uh, relation to the whole head as it's as a structure, when you're drawing a line straight down the anatomy, 
uh, from whatever angle it's tilted at, the uh, front, the corners of the mouth will line up with the front planes of the eyeballs, if that helps to know. Okay, and I'll go ahead and draw the, uh, the triangular rhythm at the front plane here from the uh, ridges of the septum at the bottom of the nose down to the chin boss. And that'll help me find the uh, crests of the upper lip where they meet the philtrum. And this girl doesn't have much of a uh, dip, like much of a cupid's bow shape in the very center. It's almost just straight across from this in this view. Uh, and then the far wing of the upper lip is extremely foreshortened and we can't really see it. But the corner of the mouth sits lower, comes back down here. Sorry, my sketch is a little messy. And let me make this a little bigger again in case you're watching this on a small screen. I tend to draw a little bit small on the screen because I'm always worried about running out of room, I guess. But it's digital. You don't really have to worry, do you? <laughs> but I do worry. It's just how I am. And if you're confused about the angles and how high to make something, you can also draw the you know your own plumb lines. So if I were to just add a plumb line to this or just a straight horizontal, I could see that the angle here is actually not that extreme. I might be actually over-exaggerating the tilt of the mouth here. So from the upper lip over to here is actually at the same. Yeah, so I was actually over-exaggerating the curvature, or the, uh, the angle of the slip here. And it's real easy to do, you know, as you can see, it just happens accidentally. But uh, just be on top of it and constantly ask yourself, you know, how things are lining up. Are the angles correct? Draw plumb lines straight up and down or side to side. And then from the corner of the mouth, it's actually open all the way over there, uh, but not too much. It's almost perfectly straight across this lower lip here. And it dips down a little bit at the center line of the lower lip. There's not much of a plane change between the red portion of the lip and the pillars of the mouth. And also, if you want to look at where the lower lip sits in relation to the upper lip um, on the front side, on the right side here, you can draw another uh, plumb line straight down from the upper lip on the reference photo. You can see uh, it's actually not too far off here, not too far away. So it's about right, about right there is front plane of the lower lip. You're going to shade this one as well in color, Yep. correct? Yep. I'm going to do it kind of quickly, though, because uh, the stream will be a little shorter than the other ones. Again, we're just, we usually keep these uh, facial features streams to about an hour. So we're basically in the home stretch here. Just want to get enough done on this to make it sort of finished looking. Yeah, I have a question from the chat, but sure. it kind of relates to the painting part. So I think I'll wait till you get to that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to sort of uh, pencil in where the teeth are here as well. It looks like the center line is, or the center tooth is right here underneath. It's, it's you know, set in from the, uh, the lips themselves because the lips have a lot of volume on their own. And then the uh, lateral incisor is just barely visible past the front uh, medial incisor. And you can see actually that ridge above the upper, the red portion of the upper lip I was talking about, it's catching a bit of a highlight right here in this area. It's a little, well, not really a highlight, just a slightly lighter value, really. Okay, and I'm going to paint some uh, gray in the background here.
And let's make this a little bit bigger so you can maybe see it better at home. Oh, Karash was wanting to know, since we can ask any question, how tall the Eiffel Tower is. <laughs> All right. Uh, I believe kidding. it's about 900 feet. Is that right? 900 something feet? I, sh I don't know. All I know is the one time we went, we were unable to go to the top. Yeah, we got to the second level, and then I think we could if we wanted to wait a real long time. Yeah. Or buy extra tickets. We thought the tickets we bought were good for the top level, but it, they weren't. It wasn't very clear. <laughs> That's okay. I think it's probably overrated. I mean, we got it. I mean, it was pretty much the same view from the second level as the top. It's not. Yeah. Much it's no St. Louis Arch. Nope. And can you get toasted ravioli in Paris? I think not. If you've never been to the city of St. Louis, Missouri, I suggest that you Google it. It's famous for one, the Gateway Arch, which is kind of a lookout tower, so to speak. And two, toasted ravioli, which are ravioli that are breaded and deep fried. Very tasty. Debbie's from around the St. Louis area, in case you weren't aware. And actually, technically, so am I. I was actually... No, okay. Oh, yeah, that's what... Okay. Debbie doesn't want me to give too much personal information. <laughs> but I never knew her when I lived on, you know, in that area. Praveen says the Eiffel Tower is 906 feet. There you go. Hey, I was pretty close. I said about 900 feet. Yep. Shiny's going to try deep frying ravioli. Yes, and definitely you dip it in like a marinara sauce or like a tomato sauce, you know, like pasta sauce or something. Yeah, because it it's really dry otherwise. Yeah. With a little Parmesan cheese and oregano. And what goes inside? Uh, usually they're meat, like a ground meat of Like some a ground beef or something? Type. Probably ground beef. But well, she can do ground sheep, right? Because she's in Oh. Beef. Uh, I don't know. So since you're on the painting part, Alan also wanted to know, is subsurface scattering applied to lips or would it be more for the skin around the lips? Yeah, I think more so the closer you get to the edge of a form where it ends, you're going to see more of that subsurface scattering because of the uh, whatever light maybe coming from behind you know you'll see that more like when you hold your uh, flashlight up to your uh, hand behind your hand you'll see the light shining through you know scattering through like your fingertips more than you know say your palm because it's just it's just thicker and it's you know more towards the center of a form uh yeah i mean it has to be a really unique lighting situation for you to notice or to see subsurface scattering i don't incorporate that thought process when i uh paint normally Maybe I should, but uh, I just I don't see it in most reference photos because most reference photos are lit from the front, and uh, any um, scattering is just I think just reveals itself as just diluted or muted colors and values, and you're not necessarily going to see any kind of luminosity lighting up say the inside of a form. Um, the only feature that really really happens on I think is the ears and sometimes a bit of the nostrils. The nostrils will often have a bit of brighter red on the inside if there's a strong side lighting because you'll uh, you'll definitely see that but I don't notice it so much on the mouth because it's um, maybe just because it's thicker skin and thicker tissues there if that's what you're asking I'm not sure if that is but uh, that's my thought it's my thoughts on that I don't know most of us are more thinking about food right now yeah what are some other st. Louis delicacies that uh, are unique to the area Debbie um, well, there's a, a pizza type that St. Louisans pretty much love, but everyone else thinks it tastes horrible. Uh, Emo's Pizza is the main pizza place. And instead of using mozzarella cheese, this thin crusted pizza is made with something called Prevel. And Prevel is kind of like provolone, but not really. Not really. Yeah, it's it's hard to describe. It's a very oily cheese, and it's not even real 
cheese, I don't think. It's like a mixture of a bunch of different cheeses. And it's very hard to get and very hard to find. Thankfully. <laughs> yeah, outsiders like me, who was not raised on that pizza, it just we generally have a horrific reaction to tasting and the and te tasting it and feeling the texture. It's just it's not like any other pizza experience you might have ever had. Sorry, Praveen. <laughs> Praveen says, you know, it's two thirty in the morning where he is, and now we're making him hungry by <laughs> talking about food. But maybe you'll have good dreams about food. One thing about St. Louis that you can't really get here, maybe you can a little bit, but it's not nearly as good, is the uh, the frozen custard that Debbie introduced me to. Ah, oh, frozen custard. Which is just basically just a rich, rich, thick, creamy version of ice cream. Yeah, it's ice cream with a lot more fat. Yeah. It says, yeah, it's called frozen custard, but for the people in the rest of the country, that sounds disgusting because we know custard as something like as a topping on pies or are on pastries well, but it's not that at all it's basically yeah, well not even a topping a filling i mean pumpkin pie really is a custard based pie yeah but it's not like custard like you might see in a pie filling at all it's just it's ice cream and they mix it at this one place with uh you know cake like physically like folding cake or pie or candy bars and it's just like the best so if you ever find yourself in st louis uh ted drew's is the place to go <laughs> for some frozen custard ted Drew. Okay, we need to stop talking about food because even I'm getting hungry and I just ate. Yeah, and we can't really go out to eat because it's pandemic. That's right. I believe, I think every week we kind of update the situation. So I think the latest is the same as it was last week. Uh, restaurants are closed for indoor and outdoor dining. So you can only go for takeout or delivery. Um, zoos are closed, museums are closed, which is tough for San Diego because we have one of the world's most famous zoos and a pretty big tourist area, which tourists are still coming, but I don't understand why. Because the other thing that I feel is kind of big is all hotels pretty much are locked down as well. They're only open for essential workers who need somewhere to stay or if you do decide to come to California and stay in a hotel right now, you have to book a minimum of a two-week stay for your quarantine. So that's kind of a big one. But the beaches are still open, yeah, as far beaches, as I know. parks, hiking trails. Parks. I mean, I think they realized, you know, back in the beginning of the pandemic, they had even, like, beaches were shut down, trails were shut down. But they realized that wasn't a source of people spreading. It's kind of necessary for people to get some exercise. Right. You really need to get out and do things. And at the beginning of the week, they had closed all playgrounds, but there was a big backlash. And now those playgrounds are for children are open. Yeah, I think the science is not all there on that one. You know, I don't know if they've done real studies. Children are little disease vectors. So you got to, you know, think that they... Uh, I mean, even though they're not going to get sick from it, probably they could pass it to their parents and other people that might come in contact with the, with the children's. And there is a bit of the cheek on the far side visible here. I don't want to cut that off too much, actually. So yeah, just the flesh portion of the cheek on the other side of the mouth is right there. This is a female study, correct? Yeah. Did I say he? No, it's just, since you're in the beginning stages, it's still kind of blocky, so it seems a little more masculine. Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of um, yeah, blocky and straight angled shapes. But anything having to do with the teeth is going to be very, very subtle, I think. The values are going to be very close together. No highlights visible at all. Uh, there's just not enough light getting in there to make a highlight. Maybe the teeth will be a little warmer, though, like a little bit more yellow, perhaps. Maybe a bit of reflected light on this lower lip. I'm sorry, the lower portion of the upper lip uh, reflecting from below. Or that could be some of the subsurface scattering, perhaps, creating that effect. But I, I wouldn't overdo it. It just... It gets a little confusing if you get too into the weeds with those uh, reflected light on planes like the lip. You just 
in most situations you're going to be painting a mouth like this like one third of this size at the biggest because like this is on my screen it's like yeah, three times larger than life size uh, just to show the details a little bit better but this is not how i would normally work on a mouth procedurally it's just it's too big it's you know so it makes me focus on details more than i would in a real world situation so I know we've gone over a little bit, but do you want to take one more question? Definitely. It's one that seems to come up a lot. Uh, it's about blending. Matt K wants to know, how do you get the in-between colors in Photoshop when blending? Uh, real simple. Uh, I'm just sampling adjacent colors. And then I have my pen pressure set to uh, opacity. So if there's a, you know, this form here of the lip, of the skin next to the lip, and I want an intermediary color, I'll just select one of these colors and paint into the other area and then resample that intermediate color and now I've got an intermediate color and uh, and I've got a brush that's not super soft I mean it's it's got a like a fuzzy brush you can see here um, so it is good for blending because there's a lot of holes in it there's a lot of texture in this brush so you can see uh, paint from underneath showing through and that's another technique as far as blending is the type of brush you're using if you have a real solid flat brush with no texture no holes in it uh, it's uh, it's actually it's a little more harsh of a painting effect so it might take a little longer to get blended effects but you definitely can you just have to have really good pen control and uh you know light touch and select your colors wisely but yeah it's just selecting adjacent colors my you know my thumb is always on my express key right here changing this from a paintbrush to a uh a sampling tool the eyedropper the eyedropper tool yeah so i'm always sampling colors from the picture once I've got a full range of colors and values in the uh, painting I'm working on, I generally don't need to go back to this color window. I do this in the beginning, I use this color window. But uh, as you know, I don't usually or ever really pick from the photo itself, uh, just because it creates bad, bad habits and makes you a weaker painter because you're not learning how to blend colors properly or how to see and judge values accurately. All right, Praveen snuck in one last question. What's the last question? So I think we've asked this one before, but it could have changed. Do you use the iPad Pro for any of your professional work right now? I do I not. You... Sim okay. Simple answer, no. Yeah, you're pretty much just using Wacom products, yeah. correct? Yeah, and I have an iPad Pro, and I like it, and I sketch with it sometimes, but I, yeah, I never have done a real job on it. It's just a little bit cumbersome to use because I don't have all my keyboard shortcuts right there at my fingertips. There's probably a way to set that up with an external keyboard. I just, you know, since I got the big, big Wacom screen here, it's like kind of luxurious. I, I feel a little constrained on an iPad. Yeah, he's spoiled. Yeah. I mean, how, what are the size, the dimensions of the Cintiq you have? I mean, it's big. It's a, it's just a 22 inch screen. I don't just know. a 22 inch screen. There are people that have like a 32 inch screen. I don't have that. That's too big. Yeah. Yeah, I pretty much am using just the iPad Pro right now, but I don't really spend as much time drawing as you do. Yeah, but I mean, if people want to get into drawing more on the iPad, because it is a cheaper option mm -hmm. um, and you can take it with you, very portable, good battery life and stuff, what would you recommend uh, app-wise? Oh, Procreate, without a doubt. Procreate. Yeah, so in case that was yeah. your next question, yeah. A lot of people use Procreate. I like Procreate. Yeah, if you are subscribed to the Adobe Creative Suite, I would recommend Fresco because it's included. But as far as having to subscribe to it every month to get the full features, I think Procreate's better because you just pay a flat fee. Of Right now, I think I paid $9.99. Or actually, Court paid $9.99 because we're on family sharing. so <laughs> <laughs> So we can both use it. So in, in that aspect, if you're, if you have more than one person in the household who wants to use it, I would say Procreate, definitely. I mean, you can't beat that price. Yep. Um, also, I just always go back to sketching an infinite painter on the iPad. This is great sketching tools. There's a Proco pencil that they did a really good job of emulating the sort of the, well, technically it's like the Watts Atelier charcoal pencil that we use there, which Stan is an outcome of that. But, um, uh, yeah, they just uh, they just got his permission and decided to call it that. <laughs> Even though Stan wasn't really involved in its development, uh, the Proco Pencil is a really, really good charcoal pencil simulator. 
if you want to do those kind of drawings and studies. Uh, and the program, is, again, is called Infinite Painter. Um, again, I don't use it that much, but when I, when I have used it, I've really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, both Court and I do have iPad Pros with the Apple Pencil. Mine is a little bit older, um, so it doesn't do, like, Court has the newer model where the pen actually attaches to the side of the iPad Pro and charges that way. Mine is a little older. I have to actually physically stick the pin in the lightning port on the iPad to charge it. So, but other than that, I think they're pretty much the same. As far as apps, I've used a few different apps. Right now I'm using Procreate pretty much exclusively. Before that, Adobe Fresco. I do like an app called Sketch Club, which I think is $4.99, which is kind of fun. You can sketch things and then they have a website where or forum where you can post things and that's kind of fun. But as far as Painter or Infinite Painter, haven't really tried those. Okay, I think we're just about done. It's still a little rough, but I, I rushed this one a little more than the uh, than the other one. But yeah, you know, I tried. Nice. To, I, yeah, thank you. I try to find places to soften the edges, you know, blend the lip into the surrounding skin. So it doesn't look so cut out. And this is a female face, but, you know, she's not wearing lipstick. It's more of a natural look. So you can even, like, lighten up the planes of the lip here to get it a little bit closer, like, to transition it into that, um, the skin above the upper lip. Okay. And then when you shrink them down, too, they should actually look a little nicer. Here they are separately um and anyway so yeah that's it for today guys is there any last minute things that are important we should uh, ask nope nope <laughs> uh well again thank everybody for your participation and thanks for joining debbie and me for this uh exciting lesson on the human mouth uh next week i'll go back to painting um actually that's right before uh, the holiday christmas so i might do might do a christmas theme thing next week rather than going back to the joe biden and kamala harris i haven't decided yet but i will finish up the um the features with the ear the week probably after that or the week after that i'm not sure how the holidays are going to play out so uh, i will finish up the features with the ear which is a very important feature as well that is very misunderstood um anyway that's about it say bye debbie bye bye thank you everyone and i'll talk to you soon <laughs>